This podcast is brought to you by the Islamic Center and NYU. For more information, visit our website at www.icnyu.org. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa bihi nasta'in wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidina wa nabiyyana wa habiba qulubina wa shafi'a nafusina abil qasim muhammad wa ala ahli baytah al-tayyibin al-tahirin. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وآل محمد. Today's discussion, insha'Allah, I thought it would be a good idea for us to talk a little bit about the importance of keeping up with our prayers during the month of Ramadan. Because, like we know, during the course of this blessed month, there's opportunity to find ourselves, learn a little bit more about who we are. And at, the same, at the, and at the same time, learn a little bit more about our Creator. One of the best ways to do so is by keeping up and engaging with our prayers in a meaningful way. But for a lot of people, it's really hard to maintain uh, an understanding of why we have to perform the rituals that we do, or that we just perform the ritual for the sake of performance of the ritual or just a complete rejection from the prayer in and of itself because of the way that we were taught about prayers. Yesterday, for instance, I was speaking to a couple of our students uh, at our Brooklyn campus at Tandon Metro Tech, if you're familiar. And they asked me to give a talk to them about how to maintain or how to build some sense of meaningful relationship with the Quran. And I asked them, uh, to share what their relationship with the Quran was individually. Some said that they have never opened it before in their lives. Some of them are new to Islam. And some of them have been reciting it from when they were very young. And some said that they feel really, really challenged and intimidated uh, by reciting the Quran because it's seemingly a book that is very distant from us, is very difficult to navigate with regards to its translation, and they don't feel like it speaks to them in any sort of meaningful way. Then I remembered that last year there was somebody who came to me and told me that he hasn't recited the Quran in uh, close to 15 years. So I told him, like, what, like, why is that? He says, it's not that I don't want to. It's not that I, uh, you know, reject it. I believe in it, of course, 100%. I believe it's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's revealed to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. I know that it's a book that is beautiful. I know that it's a book that has the ability to guide me. He said, but every time I open up the Quran, I remember this Quran teacher that I had when I was very young who would always scold me every time I would recite these ayat and these verses incorrectly. So because this guy who was telling me, I, I know him really, really well. So I told him, like, what was the verse that you were struggling with? So he told me, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <laughs> I mean, he could never get past the Bismillah. He could never, ever get past Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And I told, because he said he could not pronounce the Ra properly in Rahman or Rahim. And he said that he had that experience his entire childhood of being told that you have to recite Bismillah Rahman or Rahim like this or like that. He said, I never got past verse number one or never got to verse number one. And it makes us realize that so much of the way that we learn religion, so much of the way that we engage the tradition, so much of the way that we experience all of that which is so beautiful in front of us and that we have the opportunity to benefit from during these nights and days of Shah Ramadan, for some reason, there is these barriers that have been created for us and that virtually we have to deconstruct everything that we learned or everything that was taught to us and then relearn it in an environment that is positive. And I think that, you know, that's so much of what we try to seek and do in, in spaces like these ones. To hopefully allow for us to understand that again, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he presents these to us, this book, and he has brought down legislation like that of prayers and fasting, not because they are a burden, you know, not because they are a burden, but because they are actually something that draws us closer in love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Somebody had mentioned yesterday that they were telling their colleagues at work that, uh, you know, that they're fasting and they can't, you know, eat and drink and whatever, to which somebody told this guy who was telling me, he's like, one of my colleagues was telling me, um, you know, I feel so bad for you. He's like, why do you feel bad for me? He's like, because you can't 
eat and you can't drink coffee for this many hours and you can't do that. He's like, no, actually, like, this is the most beautiful, like, delicious, like, experience of my life. Because I find a sense of contentment during the month of Ramadan, unlike any other time. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, it's challenging. But then how many believers, how many Muslims tell themselves that, you know, why do we have to, you know, practice this? Or why do we have to do that? Because, again, we have that sort of negative approach or that deficiency approach with regards to how we engage you know, our, our religious tradition. And again, so, so much of it is to reverse and to deconstruct the way that we have been taught and the way that we learn a lot of these things. Amongst them fasting, amongst them prayers. Why do I have to wake up early in the morning and pray? Why do I have to pray in the, in the afternoon when it's inconvenient and I have to work? Why do I have to pray in the, ev- why, why do I have to pray in the evening, uh, you know, when I could be, you know, going out for dinner or spending time with my friends? Again, we see things like that of ritual as an inconvenience many a times because we only see them on the surface. And the famous line that is attributed to Ali Zayn al-Abideen, the great grandson of the Prophet of God, sallallahu alayhi wa he says, Oh Allah, who has tasted the sweetness of your love and found anything else? Meaning that there's a sense of contentment and peace the satisfaction that overcomes us and that we feel when we're in communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is precisely and exactly what we speak or what we seek during this month via all of these rituals that we perform. So today, inshallah, like I said, I want to talk, talk a little bit or reflect a little bit with regards to the importance or how we can start to becoming amongst those who hold a sense of importance and value with regards to that super important principle and pillar of our faith, Salat, Arkanu Deen, as the Hadith of the Prophet says, that this prayer is the pillar of the religion. In qubilat qubila ma siwaha wa in ruddat rudda ma siwaha. That if your prayers are accepted, then all of your deeds are accepted. And if your prayers are rejected, then all of your other deeds are rejected as well. So, how can we be amongst those who truly find the secret or the depth of our prayers on a day-to-day basis, inshallah? Firstly, it's important for us to understand that prayers is not solely a ritual, but it is meant to be a ritual that cultivates something spiritual. What I mean by that is within so much of Islamic law, if you go up and take a glance at any book of Islamic law, for instance, what you're going to find is that the majority of them, they explain to you all of the obligations and all of the prohibitions and all of the recommendations of any given ritual that we perform within the religion of Islam, be it prayers, be it fasting, be it hajj, be it whatever it might be. And we're told again, what is an obligation? What are the prohibitions? And so we learn things through this very clear yes and no, halal and haram approach toward everything within our faith. And for many people, it's like a big turnoff because we're unable to actually spend time thinking about what is the purpose and the objective of prayer, essentially. Because the only thing that we're thinking about is whether or not I'm performing the prayer properly. And I'm not saying that's not important. I'm not saying that's not important. I say this fairly often. Now, when I started uh, studying in the Islamic seminary, in my very first couple of weeks, maybe if my maybe it was my very first week, we began to study the ahkam salat, the laws of prayer. And my teacher said, um, for all of those of you who are here for a short period of time, like myself, meaning that we don't live and spend our entire life in the seminary for 30, 40 years, but we want to go back and we want to be able to serve our communities and whatnot. He said, for those of you who are uh, only here for a short period of time, for several years, then make sure that you spend time learning the laws of prayers from A to Z. And he said that there are 800 laws of prayers and that before you go home and lead your community, you have to memorize each and every single one of them. And I was like, oh my God, that's a lot of laws that I got to memorize. Many of them I realized that I already known from practicing and so on and so forth. But we just spend days and hours learning about all of the nuance of prayer. Very rarely, very rarely would there be any conversation about what the purpose of prayer was for in the first place or remind us about the spiritual dimension or potential of the prayer. It was what is permissible, what is impermissible, 
Can I wear a hat? Can I adjust my hat when I'm praying? Can someone chew gum when they're praying? Yes, no. What are we supposed to say when we make ruku? What are we supposed to say when we make sujood? What are the additional prayers that you can make? it? And everything was about details, which again is important. I don't deny it. I had to learn it. I memorize it. If you ask me about it, I probably have an answer. But at the end of the day, what does God say about prayers? He tells us, for instance, inna salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar. That your prayer is that which has the ability to take you away from transitioning all of your vices into virtue. That you have the ability to perform this prayer such that it completely transforms who you are internally. That's the purpose and the objective of prayer. It's meant to take us to that. And it said that one day a man, he comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or one of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt, and says, how do I know if my prayers are accepted? To which he responded that take a look in between your two prayers. For instance, look between Bahar and Asr. Look between your Asr prayer and your Mahar prayer. If you committed any act of wrongdoing during the course of that, know that your previous prayer didn't reach the height that it was meant to reach. Meaning what? That at the end of it all, that every prayer, in order for it to truly get to where it needs to be, you need to really transform who you are internally, who you are spiritually, who you are ethically, morally. That's what it's all about. As the hadith of the Prophet says, that I was sent down with one role, and one mission, that is to perfect the etiquette and the character of my community. The prayer is meant to be that transformative. Again, if it's done right. And if it fulfills the ritual, it transmits us and takes us to the spiritual. When the Prophet ﷺ, he returned back from making the ascension in the journey of the Ma'raj, his companions came to him and they said, O Messenger of God, how can you know we also make this ascension to the heavens? To which he famously responded to them, Salat Ma'raj al Mu'min, that the prayers is the ascension of the believer. You want to get to the heavens? Be dedicated and sincere and diligent and focused in your prayer. So, firstly and foremostly, it's really important for us to understand that prayers is not only this ritual that we perform on a day-to-day basis, five times a day, or however many times, if we perform the recommendations, but about allowing for the prayer to be something that's transformative entirely in the course of our lives. And that every day, this prayer, I should improve where I am, not only with regards to my prayer, but who I am as an individual, as I go day by day, as I go prayer by prayer, as I go year to year. That's why you'll find, right, that during the month of Ramadan, we have all of these recommended prayers that you can perform. The last 10 nights of Ramadan, we perform all of these additional prayers. In the first half, every day, there's, you know, all of this talk about, you know, spending time in prayer, spending time in du'a, spending time in supplication, so on. Why? It's not just about standing and bowing and prostrating, standing and bowing and prostrating, standing and bowing and prostrating. No. Something is meant to come out of that. But if, it's, if nothing comes out of it, well, then, like, did we do it right is the question. How we really have that mindset and that focus and that intentionality in order for it to bring us that benefit. Someone says, but I've been praying for a long time, for decades, or I just started praying, or I'm still learning how to pray. Whatever, wherever someone else, wherever someone is during the course of their respective lives, wherever they are in their respective journey, so to say. They say that I've been doing it, but I don't feel anything. Not everything is about a feeling, it's about a state of being in presence, but that has the ability and potential to be transformative. Again, if we set this idea and intention of uh, allowing for it to be a means of change during the course of my life. I want to share with you a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he speaks to his companion, a man by the name of Ma'ad bin Jabal. And he appoints Ma'ad bin Jabal to be one of the governors of the Islamic State after the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam had established his uh, his government in the holy city of Medina. And he says to Ma'ad, he says, Oh Ma'ad, make sure prayers is that which you give the most importance. In other words, what he's trying to say is, 
that if you want to make any difference in the course of your life and utilize the prayers to be that mechanism, you have to have the desire to truly make it or to truly allow for it to be the difference. What I'm, what I'm trying to say, or let me put this in perspective for you all. If we want something, anything, even if it be something tangible, if I want to get really good grades in any particular class, or I want to pass this exam, or I want to do well in work, or I want to you know, bake this amazing pecan pie, because I could use some pecan pie right now. Anyone else agree with me? Yeah. yeah. If I want to do anything particularly good and be the best at it, it always starts with a will, right? You have to have a determination. You have to have a desire to get to the goal that you want to get to. Someone can't walk into a classroom and say, I'm going to get an A in this class, but I am not going to put in any effort in studying for this class. I want to do really well in this paper, in this thesis, in this dissertation, but you know what? I'm going to wait until the very last minute and then do it. They don't actually, they can say, anyone can say that I want to do well in it, but if you don't have the desire within you, you don't have the will in you, you don't have this notion of irada, you don't have this, 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 this sort of effort that you put all of your existence into it, you're not going to get there. Or you might, if you get lucky, but more likely than not, if you don't have the focus and the determination to be where, who you want to be or get to the goals that you want to get to, it's not gonna get them. And so when it comes to our spiritual goals as well, they're identically the same with our physical. What is our mindset? Which is why so much of our religious tradition emphasizes this idea of intention. Everything starts with intention. In the Ma'amaru bin Niyat, as the hadith of the Prophet says, that every action needs an intention. And if your intention is sound and your intention is pure and your intention is sincere, oftentimes it materializes in a unique way. You might not you know, see its materialization immediately, but eventually. And so it always starts with that. Do I perform the prayer because I just performed the prayer for the sake of praying because it's an, an obligatory responsibility that I have? Or do I perform the prayer recognizing again that it has the potential to be that transformative in my life, in my heart, in my soul? In the words of Mawali alayhi salam, he says, oh Allah, I don't worship you out of fear of hell because that's the worship of the slave. Nor do I worship you out of the hope in your paradise because that's the worship of the merchant. But I worship you because you are worthy of that worship. And I know that this prayer is good for me. That's why you legislated it for me. I know that fasting is good for me. That's why you prescribed it for me. Not because I see it as a burden, but because I see myself in your state of servitude and I see that beautiful. So number one, step number one, in terms of understanding how we can be amongst those who allow for this prayer to be transformative, is to just change up the way that we think about it. And really, Sorry for sort of drawing this point out in a lot of depth. But really, once we start to see the prayer or any act of worship or any of these other rituals of obedience that we perform as something that is beautiful, even again, and we're just starting, or even if it, we're just learning, or even if we haven't started yet, then make the intention to start this way. That you see the beauty of it and you recognize that it's good for you. And all of a sudden, your entire experience changes. I'll give you an example. How many of you have ever had a job that you dislike? Most people in life, they have work, they have experiences, they have you know, challenges with people or tasks or whatever it might be. Or how many of you have attended a class you know, in college that you absolutely despised? Feed if you're a college student, <laughs> college student right now, uh, or you know you graduated a long time ago. More likely than not, there is this class that you absolutely despise. I had to take a class when I was a freshman in college called Meteorology 101 or something like that. I just got thrown into it, man. It was like a 300 student seminar. I was like, I don't know anything about science in the first place. Right? We had to learn how to like transmit Fahrenheit into Celsius. Who uses Celsius anyway, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> Only 99% uh, of the world, right? We had to learn all these things and you hate being there because I don't feel it is making, you know, any sort of unique change in my life. 
or I go back to the days when I was in high school and we had to learn logarithms. How many of you utilize logarithms today? I don't even know what that means anymore, right? Maybe some engineering students or folks or whatever. That's why I studied religion, okay? <laughs> uh, clearly, I don't know anything about the math or sciences. Anyhow, when you go to that job that you dislike, you go to that class that you dislike, you're in the company of people that you don't want to necessarily be in. The stress and the anxiety, right, leading up to being in that gathering oftentimes is the biggest, most challenging thing that we have to deal with. You're going to work, you're sitting on the train, oh God, I hate my job, right? I, I, I don't want to be around these people. I really hate this class. And you're telling yourself that so much and you're beating yourself up. Right? And you're exhausted from being in that situation until either you get out of it or you got to change your mentality. You tell yourself, right? We do this so, so often. You tell yourself, you know what? No, I have to perform. I have to do well in this class because it's going to take me, you know, to getting to my ultimate goal, which is to get my degree. I have to do this job because, you know, right now I don't have another opportunity. And so if you just change, if, if I just change my mentality and I go to work a little bit more positively, I'm able to come back home, bring back my paycheck, provide for myself and my family. And all of a sudden, right? When we change our mentality and the way that we think about certain things, many a times we're able to transform our experience in that given place. Not always, right? Sometimes we need additional support and other sort of mechanisms to aid us on that journey. But many times it's always about just changing the way that we think about any given situation that we're in. Am I right? When it comes to our prayers, it's the same exact thing. If we rethink and reconstruct and in our minds understand what the ultimate purpose and objective of this prayer is and how it can be that tool which absolutely transforms our existence, what are we going to see? We're going to see that that prayer is going to be, again, that much more impactful. So when I stand up from the state of Ruku, and I say, Sama Allahu liman hamida. What does that mean? They say, Oh Allah, you are the one who hears whoever praises you. You know that God is listening to you at that moment. When you say, Allahu Akbar, all of a sudden, your praise of God, you understand that you're in that moment of utter and absolute servitude. Again, that can be so transformational in the moment of prayer, but in every other thought and in every other experience that we go through during the course of our life. So again, firstly and foremostly, in order to be those who perform our prayer, it's important that we change up the way that we think about it. Secondly, a lot of Quranic verses, and the one that I'm going to reference to in just a moment, speak to the importance of having this quality of khushu in the prayer. For instance, God says in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Surah Al-Mu'minun, that surely the believers are successful. Who are they? Those who have khushu in their prayers. خاشعون. And in the opposing verse, God says, The first type of people are those who have this quality of khushu. How is it translated? Or what exactly does this word mean in the first place? This word is often translated, if you go and open up to, you know, different translations of the Quran, is like a fear of God in the course of prayers. Or this awe of God that we feel during the course of prayers. And you can go ahead and take a look at perhaps different translations. I don't know if there's any one that is particularly good, right, that speaks to the reality of what this word khushu means. So I'd rather present it to you in an example. How many of you, by show of hands, have ever been able to perform tawaf around the Holy Kaaba? How many have ever visited the Holy City of Mecca or been in the company of the Mosque of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? A few of you, half of you maybe. If you haven't, if you've been already, inshallah, we get the chance to go again. If you haven't been, inshallah, you get a chance to go very, very soon. The first time, right, and for those of you who experienced it, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who haven't experienced it, inshallah, you'll get a chance to experience it very soon. The first time, that someone's eyes glance at the Holy Kaaba, what happens to you? You're so over, I just right now, as I'm, as I'm talking about it, I have goosebumps in my body. The first time that my eyes glance at the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the feeling that you experience, your heart races. You don't even know 
what it is that you're looking at, you're so overwhelmed with emotion. Every thought enters into your mind, right? That you, or how can I be in this place at this moment? Is this real? That moment is something that is incredibly unique. And that moment of pleasure and contentment that you have, and for those of you who have been, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about, that contentment that you have at that given moment, you're not concerned about anything. The only thing that you're concerned about is that moment that you're in and you never want to lose that moment. And you can go back to it so many times and pick yourself up when you're not necessarily feeling so spiritual, so to say. Because of again, how transformative of an experience that is. Or even take a look at these days on a lesser scale during the month of Ramadan. You ask people about, you know, so many of our students over here, you see so many of them volunteering, alhamdulillah. A lot of them, they like don't go to class during Ramadan. We tell them they should go to class. But they say, for instance, no, like it's Ramadan, like it's fine. We're not concerned about that. We got other things going on. We'd rather be over here. People, they like, you know, slack off at work during Ramadan, right? A lot. Uh, and they're like, you know, we'll just catch up later. All these emails, who's going to respond to them right now anyway? They can wait. Otherwise, you'd be so on top of it. But during Ramadan, we give ourselves excuses, right? Beyond belief. Why? Because we're not concerned with the little things anymore, right? Who cares about work? Otherwise, work is the most important thing in our life. Otherwise, school is the most important thing in our lives, right? All of a sudden, during Ramadan, because why? Because we feel, not only we feel tired, not only we feel exhausted, not only we're hungry, not only we're not caffeinated. More than that, we just... It's not that important anymore. Today was the first day that I slept like a good sleep in the month of Ramadan. Thank God for Saturdays, right? When I woke up, like wife had kept like all these envelopes like for me. She's like, this is like the mail of the last week. I haven't been home because I'm here till late. Go back home, wake. And then when I wake up, take my kids to school. Then I come back to the center. And she's like, and I was like, what, what are all these envelopes? She's like, these are the bills. Start to pay them, right? You haven't done anything in the last, you know, in the last 10 days. And I'm like looking through all these bills, like, oh, this cell phone bill, this bill. And I was like, you know what? This whole, hold on, I'll deal with it after Ramadan. She's like, you know what? Some of them might be like late. I was like, we'll deal with it after Ramadan, right? I can't be bothered with this right now. I got, I got, I got bigger things to think. We've got bigger goals, right? We're no longer drowning in the distractions of the world. That, that focus that we have, right? In the, in the darkness of night, when I go back home, when you go back home, it's 11, 12 o'clock, 1 a.m., and you're still awake, and normally you would undoubtedly be asleep. Half of the world or you know, half of your apartment building or all of your neighbors are sleeping around you, and you open up the Quran, and you make du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're listening to something meaningful. Shaykhing it up with Shaykh Fayyaz, Nightly Ramadan Reflections podcast. Nobody follows my podcast. So I guess you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Google Play. Um, only 10 minutes long. Might put you to sleep, too. Um, you're doing something meaningful that's allowing for you to get connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that juncture, you're not concerned about anything else. That feeling whereby you only feel God when you first see the Kaaba, when you're in the midst of worship, when you're in the midst of, of obedience, when you distract or you remove all of the distractions of this world, that's khushua. That feeling that you overcome is khushua. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِئُونَ The believers are those who always feel that in prayers. That's pretty incredible if you think about it for a moment. At every prayer, I feel that feeling whereby nothing else distracts me in this world. I'm not concerned about anything other than being in that moment. Then I look at my own prayers. Then I look at my own prayers. Like we, we remember everything not important during the course of our prayers, right? I am talking about myself. Sometimes like, you know, I lost something in my house and, you know, for weeks, for months, I didn't even care about it. I completely forgot about it. All of a sudden I'm in a ruku of Malkhara prayers. I remember, oh shoot, you know, I, I remember where I kept that in this drawer under this thing and under that thing. Why? Because our minds are you know, not focused again where they need to be. Again, that doesn't mean we can't get there. I'm just talking about what the ultimate goal is to reach that state, whereby, again, we are so overwhelmed with the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that uh, 
Abu Hamza al-Thamali, he would narrate that when I would see Ali ibn Hussein Zainal Abidin in prayers, the great grandson of the messenger of God, I would see him in prayers. It was as if that God was standing in front of him, right? Not physically, of course. Or as that famous hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam says, when he mentions to Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari, he mentioned a couple of nights ago for those of you who are here. He says, oh Abu Dhar, worship Allah as though you see him. For even though you do not see him, he sees you. To being in that state of awareness and understanding. That's what it means to have khushu in prayers. Thirdly and finally, how do we get there? Number one, like we said before, you have to have that will and that intention. To get where? To get to that state of true understanding. Number three, what are some practical, realistic steps that we can take during the course of our lives toward reaching that height? Folks want to also move forward a little bit. There's a lot of space. These chairs are really comfortable for the guys. And also, there's a few sisters over here. There's, so many, there's a lot of empty chairs over here. Also, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to come in, so please don't be shy. How do we, during the course of our days, realistically, practically, try to transform our prayers and allow for them to get to that state whereby we're truly so overwhelmed with this awe and the presence of Allah. A couple of quick, you know, practical things that hopefully I say as a reminder to myself and to you all as well. Firstly, like we said before, make sure that the intent Intention is to allow for the prayers to be transformative. Don't perform the prayer because it's an obligation. Don't perform the prayer because I want to go to paradise. Don't perform the prayer because I'm afraid of going to hell. But perform the prayer, in the words of Ali salam, because God is worthy of that worship. And that you recognize that it has that, again, ability to be transformative. So number one, to understand it within this regard. To set the intention for it to be the tool which transforms us. Number two, to making sure that we believe that before the performance of any prayer that we feel as if, it's, as if this may be our last. Over the last little while, two and a half years now, we have experienced this fragility of life unlike, you know, maybe we have never experienced it in the course of our lives. We have actualized death and experienced it so much. And sometimes those reminders are really good and meaningful reminders. For those of you who lived uh, in New York City during the pandemic, you know exactly what that was like, right? How horrific it was. I remember looking outside of my apartment building and consistently seeing ambulances every day. You keep your window open in the, in, in the middle of the night and all you'd hear was ambulances. It was a frightening time. I can't tell you, I say this, uh, I said this you know, many times to this audience in the past, that in the middle, um, or two, two years ago during Ramadan, when, when things were really picking up, I remember like going to sleep some nights and I'd wake up at you know, three, four o'clock and like wake my wife up and she's like, is everything okay? And I'd be sweating. She's like, what's wrong? I said, I saw like, I would see myself drowning in dead bodies, right? Because of how many, how many, how many um, Janazah prayers I would have to go to or how many you know, funeral, funerals that I have to attend or how many people that I would have to call right? Con con offering them condolences uh, after the loss of a loved one. We don't know when that last chance that we're going to have to be in communion with the Lord of the world is going to be. That's what I'm trying to say. Life is really that transient in that reality. So to keep in mind that that opportunity may very well be our very last one. And we have to see it that way. We have to see it that way. And once we do, again, just imagine how unique that that prayer would be. Just imagine how, again, potentially transformative that that prayer has the ability to be. Number three, so number one, again, about setting this intention. Number two, to pray as if it's our last. Number three, to perform all of the prerequisites with that intention or to perform 
all of the prerequisites to making sure that we're in the state of true mindfulness when we engage in our prayers. Let me give, it, let me give you an example. When we approach the time of iftar, some people, they have like rituals, right? Before they want, before they eat. Maybe I'm the only one, right? I don't want to eat unless I take a sip of coffee first, right? Or when you're really, really hungry, if you're not over here, you know, like when someone is really, really hungry and they will like want to engage like in a really like lavish, delicious meal. I know it's probably not the best time to talk about food right now, right? But nonetheless, you have like a, you know, appetizer first. And then you have like, you know, the drinks that you want to drink. And you want to make sure that you're setting yourself up for like real success in this meal. So you're going to put the, you know, fork on the right side and the spoon on the left side. You want to drink soup first before you, you know, eat your salad or whatever it might be. You set up all of the prerequisites to making sure that that meal is the most meaningful experience that you're going to have during the course of that day. Similarly, when it comes to our prayers, it's important that we strive to do the same thing in order to beautify that opportunity and that potential for it to be and actualize the goal again that we hope for, which is again to attain that state of khushu that we talk about, to feel that presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way that we ought to. It is said that Al-Hasan ibn Ali alayhi salam, the grandson of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa ala, that when he would approach wudu before prayers, he would take the water, and as he was performing this ablution and washing his face and washing his arms and so on, his face would turn pale. To which his confidants and companions, they would come to him and they would say, Oh, my, oh, grandson of the messenger of God, like, why is your, why are you in the state? To which he would respond, Why should I not be in the state when I'm about to stand in front of the Lord of the worlds? Or as classical scholar, Muqaddis al-Irdabili, he would say, as he was approaching wudu, just the water, he would gather it in the bucket or in the pail back in that day, they didn't have sinks like we have accessibility today, he would put it in front of him. And as he would make his intention, he would say, oh Allah. He said, there are some people who get excited when they see diamonds and gold. He said, yet when I have the water to perform, for, to perform this ritual washing before I can engage in conversation with you, it's worth more than all of the golds and diamonds. Again, it's about transforming the experience of the prayer. By setting up all of the prerequisites to being something meaningful for us as well. Not performing it just because it has to be performed. It just starts with the way that we think about it in the first place. So step number three or number four, whatever number that we're on, to making sure that we are making our effort toward beautifying the recommendations or that which precedes the prayer, the prerequisite, so to say. Number five or number four, what number are we on? Anyone taking notes? Nobody? Four? Number four. Number four, to making sure that we are focusing on our prayers and nothing else. And that is something, you know, like we said, super challenging. And it takes a lifetime, right? We're always making the small steps to hopefully growing uh, and improving these prayers of ours. But we can actually do some really small things to help aid that process. Amongst them, not having our phones next to us during prayers or putting our phones on do not disturb or whatever so that we're not getting notifications while we're praying. Because you say, Allahu Akbar, you begin to recite Surah Al-Fatiha, you enter into the state of Ruku, and all of a sudden you hear your phone vibrating and you wonder and you're thinking, who's calling me? Why are they calling me right now? Are they supposed to call me 15 minutes ago, 15 minutes later? You hear, you get one notification and all of a sudden your mind is on wondering Who's trying to communicate with me right now? Or what is, in the, what is in that text message or whatever it might be? If we just put our phones on do not disturb before we engage in the prayer, we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to think about it. Or better yet, keep it like in a different room. And I'll then also put your phone on do not, your watch on do not disturb so you don't get the notifications there. We can do small things to improve again the experience. And you might not see it as something, or I might not see it as something that is so transformational but slowly, slowly, right? We're going to become more inclined to be thinking about the value of the prayer and our mind won't be on, you know, 
our, our phones or any other distractions at that given moment. You follow what I'm saying right now? Slowly, but surely, small steps, they are able to actualize into really beneficial realities. And then fifthly, fifthly, right? That's number five, we're number five. I don't even know that. I'm just making things up, you guys are thinking. No, I really have them, but then I added some more things that I didn't write down, sorry. Number five is to perform the recommended actions around prayers as well. Now, this is also pretty difficult, again, but again, it also has that ability to truly be transformative. I'll give you a couple of examples. Amongst the recommendations of prayers is to put on a good scent before we engage in prayers. To put on some cologne, deodorant, perfume, whatever it might be, before prayers. Someone says, I'm not trying to wake up at like 4.45 in the morning, right? Like have suhoor and then like start putting some cologne on or whatever, right? Why not? Why not? Just imagine how, again, that scent can remind, that nice, sweet, attractive scent will then remind you slowly, slowly of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After you do it so often, whenever you smell this good scent, you're going to remember God. And this is the etiquette of our messenger, the Prophet of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A really nice story. This has nothing to do with prayers, but nonetheless, quick, uh, quick uh, parenthesis. And it looks like I have to eat up some more time before iftar anyway. Said that there was this lady. Her name was Zainab. She used to live during the time of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alam, And her job uh, was a perfume seller. She was a perfume seller. And she would go door to door in the streets of Medina um, selling perfume. And one day she goes and she approaches the house of the Prophet She knocks the door and the messenger of God, he opens the door and he says, he says, Ya Zainab ta'tartibayti. That, oh Zainab, you have made my house smell really, really beautiful. Because she's having, carrying this briefcase, for instance, filled with all of these scents. Now listen to the way that this lady responds to the Prophet this is someone who knows who she's speaking to. This is someone who has real ma'rif and understanding of who the messenger of God is, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. She says, Ya Rasulullah, ta'atarta samawati wa lard. That, O oh, messenger of God, and you have made a beautiful scent that emanates from the heavens to the earth. Of course, the scent of the messenger of God is his natural scent. But what do we learn? At the very least, you know, before we perform our prayers, like, don't, like, be disgusting, right? Like brush your teeth, uh, put on like clean clothes, wear a nice scent, because again, the opportunity can be transformative because of the way that we approach it, right? We all of a sudden feel more confident. We feel better about who we are when we take care of ourselves. But when we take care of ourselves before we engage again in conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, that relationship again, has the ability to be very unique and transformative. So in summary, there are small things that we can do during the course of our lives, during the course of our days, to seek toward transforming this relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal, particularly with regards to our prayers. And it starts with really, really small things. It starts with the smallest intention and that will that we have to allow for it to be something that changes. Once we set that intention as we began with, that will, this irada, the messenger of God tells Mu'ad bin Jabal, O oh Mu'ad, make sure that prayers is the most important time of your day. We have to have that desire. If we don't have that will, if we don't have that determination, we're not going to be successful in our relationship with God. We're not going to be successful in our relationship with ourselves. We're not going to be good at anything. Unless again, we set that firm intention. And once we do, Remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we make those strides toward him and he will reciprocate to us. Once we walk toward God, God will run toward us. And we will see that our prayers, our acts of worship, our obedience, our relationship with him, azawajal, again, has the ability to be something that is beautiful. And those words of, uh, that are attributed to Ali Zainal Abidin, like I mentioned, Man ladi dhaqa halawata mahabbatak, parama minka badala. 
who has tasted the sweetness of your love and found anything else. Because when you find God, you're not interested in anything else. And during the month of Ramadan, we seek toward exhausting ourselves, toward finding Him as Zawajan. And once we do, again, nothing else matters. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahumma ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad. Wa ala ha tayyibina al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajah wa ajah. If you would like to listen to more, please donate to www.icnyu.org slash donate. For more of our virtual programs, go to www.icnyu.org slash classes. If you have any questions, email us at info at icnyu.org.